Uh, good morning, students. This is Mr. Papard. Uh, we're starting the Baroque period in music history. Uh, the Baroque period went from the year 1600 to 1750. 1600 to 1750. And we're going to start out talking about general characteristics of the Baroque period. Uh, let's begin with a historical perspective. The Baroque period was an era in contradictions. Uh, well, a contradiction is where you see two sides of one thing, and they seem like they're opposed to one another. That's what a contradiction is. Um, for example, in the Baroque period, religion was very important. You could see religious influence in works like Milton's Paradise Lost. It's a literary work. Uh, the construction of St. Peter's Church in Rome. That's an architectural perspective. And the passions of J.S. Bach. A passion is a musical work that reflects what happened to Christ in the last week of his life before his crucifixion and resurrection. So religion influenced all these different types of works in the Baroque period. But you also see that there was increasing secular influence. Um, science was making great strides. There were great scientific discoveries that took place. But yet religion was also equally important as science. You might recall from our previous chapters the Protestant Reformation that took place led by Martin Luther and other Protestant looters such as John Calvin. But the division between the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestants became much more pronounced, which means easier to see, much more vivid in the Baroque period. There were religious wars that took place, and Southern and Central Europe became mostly Roman Catholic, and Northern Europe was mostly Protestant. And then in England, there was another movement that happened. It was the growth of the Puritans, the Pilgrims, and the Quakers. They were uh, considered separatists in a sense, which means they were separated from the, Ang the Anglican Church, which is the Church of England. And they were persecuted, which means they were harassed because of their religious beliefs. And that's what led Pilgrims and Quakers to come to the New World, which was, of course, played a part in the founding of the United States of America. Let's talk about uh, scientific and philosophical discoveries in the Baroque period. Galileo is a really well-known scientist that was born in the Baroque period. Uh, he was actually born the day the artist Michelangelo passed away. Uh, Galileo made great scientific discoveries, but, for example, he discovered that the sun was the center of the solar system. But this contradicted what the church taught, which was that the earth was the center of the solar system. So Galileo had to recant or give up his scientific discovery because he faced pressure. And interestingly also, the day that Galileo died... A great English scientist, Isaac Newton, was born. Newton was fascinated with the relationship between planets and stars. Um, and he, dis he studied concepts such as gravity and time measurement. Uh, he also studied the use of the pendulum. A pendulum is something that just swings back and forth, right? A pendulum. And uh, this later influenced discoveries in music and even the invention of a, a device we've already discussed in our class, the invention of the metronome. Uh, there were also some great philosophers. Uh, one of them was uh, Francis Bacon. Uh, another one was Rene Descartes. Uh, these are well-known philosophers from the Baroque period. As far as artistic style, let's talk about three areas, literature, painting, and sculpture. 
In literature, uh, the Baroque period led to the birth of great novels. Uh, for example, one of them is Don Quixote de la Mancha by uh, De Cervantes. And its two main characters exhibit contradictions. There's the spiritual and whimsical Don Quixote, and then there's the uh, more down-to-earth Sancho Panza. So again, you see the idea of contrasting concepts, contrasting, in this case, characters. Uh, as far as in painting, uh, broke painters were fascinated with the properties and the effects of light, and that led to drama in their works. Uh, one of their uh, one example of this type of work is we're going to go ahead and jump ahead. It's called the Conversion of Saint Paul by Caravaggio, and you'll see in the painting you'll see how there's darkness in the edges of the painting, and that really contrasts with the light. And uh, this is Saint Paul. Actually, his name at the time was Saul on the ground, and this is just uh, another man that was with him. But uh, this painting tells the Bible story about Saul's conversion. He used to be called Saul, and then his name was changed to Paul. What happened? Basically, uh, Saul was riding on a horse to a city called Damascus. Damascus is a city that still exists today. And uh, he was trying to capture Christians and put them in prison. And he even some of them, he consented to some of them being put to death. But what happened when he was on this horseback journey to Damascus, a light came from heaven and knocked him off his horse, which you see in the painting. And, and Jesus spoke to him from heaven and said, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Which means, basically, you would think of it today as, why are you bullying me or why are you working against me? And because of this encounter that Paul had, um, Paul was blinded. Later, his sight was restored due to a miracle, and he converted to Christianity, and he became a great preacher, preacher of, of the Christian faith. And But again, you see in this painting uh, of the story the contrasting darkness with light. Um, as far as... Uh, this is a church and a monastery in Austria... And if you look real closely, you can see the great detail of the architecture. It's very ornamented. Um, and actually, the word Baroque actually means ornamented. And this kind of architecture is very typical of Baroque architecture. And later, we're going to learn about how there's ornamentation even in the music. Not in the way it's printed, but in the way it sounds. Uh, also affecting uh, the Baroque arts uh, was architecture. This is uh, a sculpture of, again, another biblical figure named David. Uh, this is when David was a teenager and he fought a, a, a great giant named Goliath. And all he had was a slingshot and a stone. And, he, and the Bible says that David propelled the stone with his slingshot and it hit Goliath in the forehead. Uh, incidentally, Goliath was like nine feet tall. He was, he would have been really popular in the NBA. Uh, but uh, it, it, needless to say, David killed him with the stone. And this sculpture portrays the uh, action of David slinging that stone to kill Goliath. Let's talk a little bit about music, uh, more specifically in the Baroque period. Uh, in the Baroque period, uh, composers were interested in both religious and secular. Remember, secular means non-religious music. So sacred, remember, means religious. Secular is non-religious. And during the Baroque period, the first public opera house opened, and there were the first public concerts. Public means that it was open to just the common person like you and I whoever could afford uh, the price of a ticket to go see the opera or to go see the concert. Whereas before, concerts were done mostly for just the wealthy or for kings and queens, you know, in the royal courts. Um, because there was a growth of 
music for the public, there was this led to the growth of patrons. Now you might think of the word the Spanish word patron, which means boss, uh, or someone who's in charge. Well, the English pronunciation is patron, and a patron is someone that gives money to support something. Usually it's the arts. Uh, it could be art, it could be music. In fact, today, if you go to a public concert, for example, the Corpus Christi Symphony, um, you'll see in the program the list of songs. There are, there are advertisements, but there's also a list of patrons. That's people that have donated money to support the symphony. Well, this started even back in the Baroque period, and some of the patrons or supporters of music during this time were the church, the royal courts, governments, and the... Uh, and when we when we talk about government, uh, sometimes there would be town composers. For example, let's say in the city of Robstown in the year 1700, although Robstown didn't exist then, but let's say that it did, uh, you go down to City Hall and there might be an office for the town musician. That would be the musician in charge of music for the town. So that's how governments supported music as a patron. And of course the public would be, again, people that would purchase tickets to go to concerts. And the Baroque period music was also, one again, of contrast. There were contrasts in literature, contrasts in art. There's also contrast in music. Uh, one of the contrasts was in the use of sacred and secular music, which we already touched on. Uh, but another uh, way that contrast is seen in the, is in the use of movements or sections in music. Uh, you might have one musical work, but it would be divided in different sections or movements. And sometimes those sections or movements would have contrasting um, themes or contrasting moods. This was called the doctrine of affections. Uh, you know, affection just means love for something. All right. And a doctrine is a belief. So you might call the doctrine of affections. It Today we might call it belief about musical emotion. Uh, and the doctrine of affection simply stated that you would only have one emotion or one feeling expressed in a section or movement of music at a time. And now in modern music, we can have one song and it can take us from an emotional high to an emotional low. You, it can make you laugh and make you cry in the same song. But in the broke period, they didn't think that this was the best expression of musical talent. And so if you would have one emotion at a time in the music. Remember, we've talked a lot about texture during this course. Well, you would see contrasting textures. Remember, polyphony is what we had in the Renaissance period, and this, would, this was held over from the Renaissance period. Remember, polyphony is where you, poly means many, phonic means sounds, polyphonic or polyphony. Uh, you would have independent melodies working together to create... Um, a pleasing sound. Now remember, homophony is where we would have something like chords playing and you would have a melody on top of it. Uh, for example, I'm going to just switch over here to the piano and you would have something uh, like maybe you would have chords going and let's get some sound going here. I'm sorry for the... Uh, sound going and somewhat there might be a melody above it love, I love to worship my King Jesus my praises I bring that's just a little song I just made up my voice provided the melody and the piano provided the chords so that would be an example of homophonic texture. And of course, in the Baroque period, you wouldn't have the piano. You would have something like uh, a harpsichord playing, supported with its bass line, supported by a cello. And then there would also be other voices or instruments providing harmonies. Now, also, we saw in the Baroque period the rise of tonality. Um, now, remember in the uh, 
earlier periods, we use modes. And again, I'll switch back over here to the piano. If you look, the modes were all based on just the white keys. We've talked about this in class. That's called Ionian. This is the Dorian mode. Gian. These were the scales that were used in the Middle Ages and in the Renaissance. But in the Baroque period, we saw them focus on just two scales. The C scale and the A scale, which was Aeolian mode. And these later transition into what we now call as tonality. Uh, tonality just means that every scale has the same type of sound no matter what note you start on. And of course this replaced modality, which is the use of modes. That concludes our introduction to the Baroque period. Please contact me on Remind if you have any questions. Thank you.